And if we're not paying attention to that as the provider, we are not going to be able to build a sustainable long-term business. Dang. Dropping bombs today. I love it. I love it so much because it it is so true that we get so caught up with wanting to prove ourselves that we're that that we're just overwhelming, feeding them a fire hose, and then and then not really solving a problem because like, oh, education, education, education. They don't they don't really care. They don't want to know how the sauce so just bring the spaghetti out. I'll eat it. Exactly. Hey, I'm Armando Leduc, producer, film actor, and owner of Leduc Entertainment. I have chosen a life off the beaten path and wanted to find others that are doing the same. Spaghetti on the Wall is a show based on all of the years that I've thrown spaghetti on the wall and nurtured what's stuck. We will share fun stories, ideas, tips, tricks, and more. Welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Depending on when you are consuming this podcast, Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another one, and I'm super excited. I am super excited. Very seldom do I read a book and go away with so many nuggets. Like, I, I sometimes, like, I go through a book, and I'm like, I got to finish this book. Like, I have to finish this book. But your book on Never Lose a Customer Again, just blown away. Joey Coleman is in the house. Oh, Armando, you are too kind. You are too kind. Thanks for the kind words about the book. Thanks for inviting me on the show. And thanks to everybody who's listening in, watching along. So excited to have our conversation today. I am super stoked. And um, it's, you know, your your book sort of launched this client journey mapping. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about how I lost, you know, $30,000 a month worth of business in like, two, three days. And part of it was because my clients were getting angry about where they were in the process. And uh, I came across your book and it sort of changed the game for me. Um, and so I want to know, like, I want to dive in, dive in so that we can like give the listeners like some really good nuggets and y'all should definitely read the book. But how did you come up with this, this concept? You know, Armando, I was running an ad agency. I ran an ad agency for about 15 years that I founded. Uh, I was the creative director. And my job was to help my clients get customers of their own, get clients of their own. So we did marketing campaigns. We did advertising campaigns. I built websites. I designed brand identities and logos. And I was doing all this for companies all over the country. And I ran this huge campaign for a client. And it was really successful. They got all kinds of new business. And about four months later, I was having a regular check-in call with them. And we were talking about the budget for the next year. And I said, well, given what I'm imagining is all the new money and revenue we made, we can really, you know, pour some fuel on the fire and really take it to the next level next year. And the point of contact, the head of marketing said, well, Joey, actually, we got a lot of new clients, a lot of new customers. You're right. You, you, we rung the bell. We, we did really well. But... We, we just haven't kept them. And I was like, wait a second, what? You haven't kept them? They said, yeah. I said, well, did, did we get the right type of client? I mean, were we finding the ideal prospect? I mean, he's like, no, Joey, we had the right people. They just quit. They left. Armando, this drove me insane. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, you mean all the effort, all the money, all the tears and the sweat that we put into that campaign and it worked. And then you didn't experience the benefit from it, we got to investigate. And so I began a months long investigation trying to figure out what happened. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized that often companies are really good at getting customers and really not so good at keeping customers. And so the more I figured out all the little things they were doing that just made no sense, I was like, how are you guys doing this and thinking this is a good idea? The more I studied that and realized that within this organization, the more I was curious is, well, what about other companies? And that led me on a multi-year investigation to figure out what is this behavior globally. And what we found, looking at all the research from around the world, product and service businesses, online and offline, bricks and mortar businesses, nationally based businesses, international businesses, you name it. What we found is that 20 to 70% of new customers quit before the 100-day anniversary. 20 to 70%. These numbers were staggering to me. Yeah. But what was scarier, Armando, was that the average business owner 
had no idea what their percentage was. They had no idea how many customers they were losing. And this marked the transition of Joey running an ad agency to Joey being a speaker, Joey being a writer, Joey being a consultant and an evangelist for taking care of your customers after the sale. Amazing. Beautiful. Uh, you know, actually, that's kind of it's when something happens in your business and you lose out that's when like you you get like okay something has to change and we had the same problem right like we do marketing and you know social media and all that and like we're bringing in clients for them but then what happens is everybody's so focused on acquisition 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 and i'm like guys like what about when they're here already and and getting referrals and all of that and like they're not even focused on it right not at and all. it's just it's it's it blows my mind. So how did you come up with the, what is it? It's seven. Eight phases. Right? How, eight phases. Eight phases. Yeah, yeah. Right. How did you come up with the phases? Well, I started to think about why is it that people join our organization? Why do they come and become customers? What do they do once they arrive? And what do they do once they leave? And kind of looked at a journey. And the idea of customer journey mapping has been around for a long time. But what I tried to do is map the journey, not only from the perspective of what are their touch points with our organization, but also what is going on mentally, emotionally, psychologically for the customer as they navigate through it as well. And so what I try to do is come up with a framework that could be applied to any business, regardless of size, regardless of industry, regardless of tenure to map a customer journey. What's the typical customer journey look like? Giving enough nuance for people to plug in, you know, little unique things about their business. And what I found is that there are eight distinct phases to the customer journey. And the secret is in each phase, you should be doing everything you can to create the kind of remarkable experience that will catapult that person to the next step in the eight phase journey. And what's interesting is the way I present the eight phases is they're presented in a circle. And the reason they're presented in a circle is because when you get all the way through all eight phases, they start over again and they begin the process over. Anytime you upsell, anytime you offer them a new product, a new service, they go back to the beginning of those eight phases. Now they go through the circle faster the second time, or at least we hope, but this idea that our job of creating remarkable experiences is not a race with a finish line. It is a perpetual cycle that we continue to dive into and invest in and continue to hold our customers' hands as they navigate that journey. And so part of the, the, the phases are where they are in the process of the deliverables, but also the, the mind frame and the mindset as to where they're at. Exactly. And so what I try to do is think first and foremost from what is going on in the customer's psyche and the customer's emotions and the customer's interactions. And then we actually build the business touch points and interactions around that. Whereas most companies say, well, I know, we'll, we'll send them this and then we'll send them that and then we'll talk to them over here. And it's like, I understand why you're doing it, but you're coming at it from what matters to you instead of coming at it from what matters to them. This is where a lot of companies will flood a new customer. This happens in info product all, companies all the time. I was working with a company years ago and they're like, Joey, we have over 300 training videos that our members get access to when they join our membership. I said, oh, okay, interesting. And they're like, and what we do is we assign them to watch some videos each day. I said, okay. And they're like, so usually we sign them about four videos a day. I'm like, okay, how long are these videos? And they're like, oh, Joey, they're amazing. They're like 30 to 60 minutes each. I'm like, okay. And some of you at home are doing the math right now. And you're like, oh my gosh, you're designing, assigning them two to four hours of homework per day. I said, tell me about your ideal target market client. They said, Joey, it's really simple. We work with entrepreneurs who are completely overwhelmed to help. And I, and I was just like, you stop, stop right there. You mean you create entrepreneurs that are completely overwhelmed? And I watched a light bulb go off, light bulb go off above the CEO's head as he said, oh my gosh. We're adding to the overwhelm. I said, yes, you are. The only thing we did in their business, the only thing we did in their business is we said, if you could send them one video a week and the video was less than 15 minutes, 
what video would you pick? And suddenly they took that 300 video library and they narrowed it down to four videos that were about 15 minutes each that came out once a week for the first month. They saw a dramatic increase in their retention. They saw a dramatic increase in the usage and the number of people watching the videos. They still had the other 300. I didn't say, you know, burn the rest of the videos. They were still there. It's just we didn't fire hose people in the first five minutes of being in relationship with them, which is something that a lot of businesses do, mainly because I think we're trying to show value. I know I'll show value by doing a lot of stuff with you right at the beginning. Now, how about you show me value by appreciating what's going on in my life and then giving me only the things I need right now to succeed to get to the next stage? That's a beautiful thing. That is a really beautiful thing. I can't say that I'm always thinking that way, right? Because as entrepreneurs, we're, you know, we're just like, all right, we got to move quickly. I had a transformative experience last week. Um and I would like to know your thoughts on like, you know, energy and vibrations and high vibrations. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I'm a, I'm a big believer. I, everything in the universe vibrates. And the more we become aware of the vibrational nature of everything else we do, I think the easier life becomes. I'll also add when you say, well, we entrepreneurs are guilty of this. Humans are guilty of seeing the world from our own perspective, not only first and foremost, but for many people, without exception to any other perspective or point of view. This is the challenge I think we find ourselves in in this day and age. We have more focus on what it means to me and less focus on what it means to we. We have more focus on, well, this is what I believe instead of, well, this is what we should discuss and try to figure out what collectively we can believe. I, I think it is pervasive across businesses, but you're right. It does over-index pretty strongly in entrepreneurs. Yeah. So, you know, I had my blinders on and, and I was at this conference and this person was talking about energy and I was like, okay, it's another woo woo thing. But, you know, I, I stopped and I listened and she's like, you know, could it be that maybe you're just, you know, you're just so focused on the goal and you and you got your blinders on that you're not leaving yourself open to suggestion and open to like things that could be that, you know, that, you know, you, you just because you want to add value like you're talking about and, and you want to be sort of the expert you get kind of in your own way right because you're all like i'm gonna pontificate and i'm gonna tell you how to do this right and therefore you're gonna come on the journey with me and it's like that isn't how it works you know like you've got to let go and you have to actually put put the energy out there so talk to me about how to do that i mean have you always had that talent or is that a learned behavior well, you're, you're kind to act that I have the talent in full effect, Amado. Thank you for that. Now, it's, it's an evolving effort, right? I mean, I think if I look at the typical, I'll, I'll look at my experience as a business owner, and I think it is semi-similar to many others' business as, or experience as a business owner. When I first started my business, I wanted to get clients. And I knew that if I wanted to get clients, they had to believe that I was credible in what I was going to be able to produce for them, it, that I had a track record, that I had a certain skill set, that I had an understanding, that I was going to be able to give them something that they either didn't already have or didn't want to spend time on themselves to create. They wanted to hire me to create and hire me to help provide for their business. The challenge with going into it with that mindset is once they said yes, I didn't necessarily see it as, oh, okay, well, they've They've hired me. They believe I'm credible. They believe I have the skill. They believe I have the understanding. I saw it as, well, they've given me a chance. So now I need to prove how smart I am. I need to prove Preach. all the skill I have. Oh, my gosh. And I I was horrible as a provider as a result. I remember somebody hired me to design one of my first clients. Gosh, I wonder if they're listening. One of my first clients hired me to design some logos. And I thought, what they're looking for is the broadest expanse of possibility. So I designed 78 distinct logos. And we brought them for the meeting. And I said, guys, I'm really excited to meet with you. It was three, three founders, all males. I said, guys, I'm really excited to meet with you. I have a bunch of concepts that we're going to go through today. And I proceeded to walk them through 78 unique 
different designs. Wow. Normano, I'm thinking, these guys are loving me. This is fabulous. We got to the end of the presentation and they're like, yeah, so we think we should probably just end the project right now. I said, excuse me? They're like, you, this is like throwing a bunch of spaghetti against a wall and hoping something will stick. Which of these is a good idea? We liked some of them. Others we didn't. Some we thought had a lot of promise. Others we were like, why did he even include this? What are we missing? I had given them no guidance. They had paid for expertise. They had paid for understanding. They had paid for a shortcut to where they were trying to go. And I had thought that they wanted to be educated on all the aspects of graphic design that I knew about. You might have had this experience with some doctors. I have a lot of chiropractor clients, right? And a lot of chiropractors I've worked with. And I'm a fan of chiropractic care. The problem is most of the educational systems for chiropractors are designed to have the chiropractors educate people on chiropractic care. So you go to the doctor and they're like, well, let me tell you about all the things you could be doing in your life to have a healthier life. Thanks, doc. I got it. What I want is an adjustment so that I'm out of pain so I can get back to my life of making bad choices. Right? There's a difference between what the customer is saying they want and what they actually want. And if we're not paying attention to that as the provider, we are not going to be able to build a sustainable long-term business. Dang. Dropping bombs today. I love it. I love it so much because it it is so true that we get so caught up with wanting to prove ourselves that we're that that we're just overwhelming, feeding them a fire hose, and then and then not really solving a problem because like, oh, education, education, education. They don't they don't really care. They don't want to know how the sauce. Just bring the spaghetti out. I'll eat it. Exactly. I don't need exactly. to know how it's made. Yeah. That is such a. So once again, did you how did you get here? Like did just because of the the, the research? Was, Pain. You know, Pain, you have a, right? Yeah, Trial and error, yeah. foolishness and pain. And so luckily that client, the client I told you about with the 78 logos said, and of course, this is one of my first clients. I'm like, I got to save the client. I said, folks, I apologize. I was so excited about the potential of what your identity could be in the world that I failed to recognize that, especially because there's three of you as co-founders, you might not be looking for all the things that could be you might be looking for the one thing that it should be and what you could create that would not only resonate in the marketplace, but the three of you could get an alignment behind. Is that a more accurate assessment for really what the assignment was? And they're like, well, gosh, now that you mention it, yeah, I said, here's what I'd like to do with your permission. I'd love two weeks. I'd love to go take what we just looked at, what we talked about. You give me any quick feedback you want on what we did, but we're not going to go through each of those 78 examples again. I'm going to go spend two weeks and I'm going to come back to you with three ideas for what your brand identity could be. And I'm gonna explain the story that you could potentially tell when you meet someone at a cocktail party. I'm gonna explain how this logo could show up on your business card, on your website, on a t-shirt somebody's wearing at an event so that you can get a feel for what it would be like to live in that universe. And then we will talk through the pros and cons of each because by the way, every identity we come up with has pros and cons. And we'll get into a little bit of an understanding of what making this choice today might cause for us in the future, both in terms of opportunities and consequences. They said, that sounds fair. So I went and I did that and I came back and we had a completely different approach. And then going forward, I never presented more than 10 ideas to any client ever again. And most I presented three to five. That's amazing. Talk to me about how people can use customer journey mapping, not just for obviously creating an amazing customer experience, but how this transforms the marketing and advertising aspect, right? Like, cause there's more focus here. How, how does it translate with, you know, training employees and scaling a business, right? Cause it's super intentional. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, anybody in marketing and sales has probably heard the discussion of features versus benefits. Right. And most marketers, most salespeople want to talk about the features. Oh, this does this. This does this. Oh, it also does this. And then every once in a while, they're like, oh, yeah, and that's good because it'll help you do it. The best way to sell any product, any service is for the prospect to have a clear understanding of what life is like without this product or service, 
and a clear understanding of what life will be like with this product or service. And that the distinction between those two lives is you won't want to be in the life you're in anymore. You'll want to be in this new vision of what life will be like in the future. That's more of a conversation about benefits than a conversation about features. What's in it for me? Most businesses are so excited to provide value across dozens of different criteria that they stop to ever have the conversation in a marketing or sales context with what are you actually trying to achieve? And they also even stop to think logically about it. I spend most of my days, Armando, as a professional speaker. I get to travel all over the world doing keynote speeches and workshops. If I were to ask a non-speaker, if what do you think the person who's booking professional speakers, what do you think their number one goal is? What do you think they might say? I'm not saying this is what you would say, but what do you think people might rattle off as some of the top goals that the meeting planner has who's going to book a professional speaker? Uh, what do you think? Entertain and engage. The entertain, engage, educate, give them actionable take takeaways, get a standing ovation. Yes, those things are all nice. You know what they really want? Someone who's going to show up on time Deliver the presentation in a way that leaves them, the person who booked them, not looking like an idiot for having booked that person. And at the end, achieve their boss's goals. Now, their boss's goal may be, hey, we just need a keynote speaker. Their boss's goal may be, we need to motiv motivate everybody so we sell 10% more widgets next quarter. Their boss's goal may be, we need to bring everybody together to you know, see a common vision because right now we have just too many people running in too many different directions. If you don't get clear on what the actual goal is, we could be having all kinds of conversations about how I'm going to entertain. We have all kinds of conversations about how I'm going to educate. We could have all kinds of conversations about actionable takeaways. But if you're not 100% sure that I'm going to be there, <laughs> we've got a fundamental problem. So one thing that's part of all of my speeches is I say, hey, a couple things you need to know about working with Joey. I fly in the day before the event. Always. I never fly the day of the event. Why? Because I'm not piloting the plane. If I was had my own plane and was flying my own planes, I might feel comfortable flying in the day of because I'm flying on Delta Airlines, who I love, by the way. I'm at their mercy as to whether this is going to work or not. Now, they deliver a remarkable experience. They get me there on time. Everything's good. But I'm always flying Delta. I'm always flying in the day before. We're also going to do a tech check a mi for a minimum of one hour before the doors open for anybody in the audience. Joey, you don't go on stage till 5 p.m. Great. Does that mean we need to do tech check in the morning before it starts? I'm happy with that. I'll come at 7 a.m. and do a tech check. Well, why are we going to do a tech check of an hour? Because I'm going to work with your team to run through every single slide, every single video, every single cue. I want to know where the lights are. I want to know if we're going to go to Q&A. Do we have mic runners or do we have microphones set up that the people are going to have to walk to? How am I going to orient that? I want to know where the bathrooms are so that if I'm doing a three-hour workshop, I can announce at the beginning, hey, if you need to use the restroom, go out the door, down two doors to your right. There's where the restrooms are. I need to take care of the audience. And in order for me to take care of the audience, I have to be willing to put in the homework to think about the whole experience, not just what am I going to say? No, what are you going to feel? That is awesome. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think that you, you, you nailed it in terms of the benefits. How, and I've gone through your book, big problem with uh, uh, entrepreneurs is that they have so many ideas. And there's so many different ways. And then I guess, and I'll, I'll just speak from experience. I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I'm just going to speak for me. So my problem has been with the customer journey, like we have it laid out, right? And we come back and we go, is, you know, could we do this? Could we do that? There's always this, could we do this? And could we do that scenario? How do you advise people to be okay with their decision and like, go with that and, you know, trial and error. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, how long are, you know, metrics, how, how are you guiding someone through that process? I've come across this really incredibly novel way to find out if people like what's happening. 
And what you do is you ask them. (laughs) It's shocking. It's shocking, but it works. So you just ask people. You say to somebody after they've decided to work with you and you maybe they've been working with you for a while, my favorite thing to ask, and I do this with not only my customers, but I do it with my employees as well. We have stop, start, continue sessions. Here's how this works. We get together, like with my employees, by the way, this happens anywhere from once a month to once a quarter, depending on their position. So this is happening all the time. And what we do, and you can do this with your customers as well, we have a one-hour meeting called the Stop, Start, Continue meeting. And everybody comes to that meeting with two to three things that we're doing right now that we should stop doing. We should just stop doing this. There's no reason. Why are we doing this? This is, doesn't make sense. Two or three things that we should start doing that we're not doing right now, but you know we really should start doing this. And two or three things that we're doing right now that we should double down on, that we should continue doing. So stop, start, continue. And the reason everybody has to come with two or three is because the first one is usually kind of wasted, right? Oh, what what should we uh, start doing? Uh, Or what should we stop doing? Well, uh, stop being so awesome. No, uh, stop, uh, stop sending as many emails. Let's, let's, let's just do that. Well, which emails? Well, just all of them. Just stop as many as you can. You know what I mean? It's just something that we, it usually doesn't give us as much juice as we want, but if we dive deeper, we start to get answers that are then actionable. I think the secret is to optimize your business And then always be open to continue to optimizing it, but not get caught in analysis paralysis of, well, we need to, we need more data. This is the thing that drives me crazy about data. So many companies really, really focused on collecting a lot of data. I am less interested in how much data you can track and collect and more interested in what you are actually doing with that data. You survey your customers and ask them how, how you're doing. Does anyone read those surveys? Does anyone do anything with those surveys? I filled out surveys for major brands that I've written. Here's my name. Here's my phone number. Here's my email. If you are reading this, junior customer service representative somewhere at this company, and you call me, I will personally Venmo you $50 because I'm just curious to see if anybody's actually reading these. Armando, I've never had to send money. I've never had to send money and all the times I've done that. Half the time we're not even, we're, we're, we're either A, not asking at all, or B, we're asking, but we're not acting on the information we glean after we ask. That's the, that's the difficult part, right? Like what to implement, what not to implement. I guess that that's the, that's the, 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 the role of the CEO and visionary. It's like, all right, yay, nay, yay, nay. Are, are you familiar with Pat Lencioni's uh, Six Types of Working Genius? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Pat and I share the same agent, actually. He's a okay. remarkable writer and we have a, We both have a great agent. But yeah, absolutely. This is the question. Well, what, which ones do we act on? Years ago, I heard an interview with the uh, CEO of 37 Signals, the company that makes the software base camp. Mm-hmm. And he had a really interesting idea. Somebody asked him, they said, from a software development point of view, how do you decide which features you're going to roll out next? And he said, well, we have a a meeting where we decide what are the new enhancements to the software we're going to have. And we have those meetings about, you know, twice a year. He said, great. So do you keep a running list of what everybody says they want? He says, no, not at all. They're like, well, what do you mean? You don't have a running list where you tabulate all the different things people suggest? He said, no, here's the thing. If enough people have suggested it, we know that it should happen. If one person says, you should change your contract. You should take that under advisement. But I'm a lot more interested in your contract if 10 people say you should change your contract. Now I'm going, there's probably an issue with your contract. Hmm. So look at to how many people are saying that something is a point that needs improvement. And if it's an improvement that is systematic that you can make to change for everyone. This is why, again, I like the stop, start, continue model. What are the things we need to continue doing for everyone? What are the things we need to start doing for everyone? What are the things we need to stop doing for everyone? Do you take some of these things and apply it to your personal life? I try. I try to the best I can. 
I try to do the best I can. We have I have stop start continue meetings with my wife and with my kids, uh, where it's just like, hey, what's Daddy doing that Daddy could be better at? You know, how how can we uh, how can we change that? And then I also think this idea of where it kind of ties this back to the thing we were first talking about. You know, where are we finding our identity? Am I am I finding my identity by how I'm showing up for you or how I'm showing up for me in the context of you? So what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, you need to get your kids the newest shoes and the the coolest this and make sure there's these presents at the holidays or in a birthday and do, do, do. And, you know, I, I think most kids spell love T-I-M-E. Not all kids, but most kids. And so how are you spending quality time with your family? And what's your definition of quality time? You know? It's quality time. You're all sitting on the couch together, but you're on your phone and they're watching a movie. Not really quality time. It's quality time. Hey, we all get to dinner together, but we really don't talk or we're all buried in our phones or we're all watching TV. I'm not anti-TV. I'm not anti-phone. I'm anti you thinking that that is something you should be doing when you are in physical proximity of another human that you're trying to create connection with. Yeah. Joey Coleman. Fantastic, man. So if somebody so if somebody wants to work with you and your team, I'm 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 sure you offer this, right? As a service? Yes. Okay. I figured. Um so talk to me about that and 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 how people work with you and that that good stuff. Yeah, so there's really two main ways that I work with folks. Sometimes folks will say, Joey, we want this message in our organization. So I'll come speak at an annual meeting, a conference, a trade show, share the message of how to take care of your customers, how to take care of your employees. Sometimes people do a variation on that theme. They'll throw a customer appreciation event for all of their customers who are business owners and then invite me to present at the event. So they're providing education for the people. I love doing those. So much That's fun. Cool. Very, very fun. The other thing I do is consult. And so I work with about, you know, eight to 12 companies a year where we come in and look at your customer journey or your employee journey or both. And we figure out how to make it better. When I say we, it's me working with your team. Because your team knows more about the way your business runs, about what works, what doesn't work, than I will ever know. Because they're immersed in it all day, every day. Not to mention, if I can get your team involved with coming up with how we can make it better, when it comes time to implement, I've got built-in ambassadors for the ideas that we have co-created. So our implementation is faster, more effective, and more efficient because it's been a team sourced idea. Now I'm certainly adding my thoughts and ideas in as well and things I've learned from clients I've worked with, but we kind of assess what the current journey is. We figure out ways to make it better and then we go implement the necessary steps to make it better. That's awesome. Joey, I'm going to tell you, and, and no offense to my other guests that have been on this show. I really appreciate everybody coming on, but I, I have, I just love the idea of like a customer, you know, customer service, customer centric, um, organization and, you know, and when you learn, when you lose, you know, $30,000 a month in retaining business, like almost overnight, you know, and it, and it almost tanked my business, you know, and like reading, mm -hmm. you know, reading your book and just like really getting, that into me. I mean, and, and we're not, you know, perfect by any means, but we have now obviously put the customer first and they know it like they can feel it a at least, you know, at least we're doing, you know, doing the work. You know, I think uh, I think for a minute there we did do kind of what your your friend did or one of your clients did 300 videos. It wasn't that it wasn't that bad, but we did like we were just like hitting them at, at all times. And I'm like, yeah, you're right to this point it's just you don't want to overwhelm the the client so um joey coleman where do they can where can they find you 
the best place to find my books, which are called Never Lose a Customer Again and Never Lose an Employee Again, is wherever you like to get books. If you like to read hardcover books, we've got a hardcover you can take notes in the margin. If you like an ebook on your Kindle or Nook, we've got ebooks. If you've liked the sound of my voice, I narrate the audiobook. So you can find those wherever you like to get books Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local indie bookstore, etc. The best place to find me is on my website, joeycoleman.com. That's J O E Y, like a baby kangaroo or a five year old, you know. Coleman, C O L E M A N, like the camping equipment, but no relation. Joeycoleman.com. You'll find videos there. You'll find downloads to help you map and enhance the customer journey and the employee journey. And I just want to thank everybody who was kind enough to join in and listen to our conversation today. I thank you, Armando, for being such a great host and inviting me on the show. And I wish everybody the best of luck, not only in those first 100 days where you want to focus on the relationship, but in every relationship you're trying to enhance by designing and creating more remarkable experiences. Couldn't have said it better myself. Joey Coleman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Spaghetti on the Wall brought to you by Leduc Entertainment for all of your digital marketing needs, social media, podcasting, we got you. And if you need to listen to Spaghetti on the Wall, you're probably listening to it right now. So continue listening to where it is right now. And we'll see you all next week.